I love that song. I, I normally, if I don't know when I look it up before that, that was beautiful. Is that new, Amber? Mm-hmm. Yes, that's really, and it does. It feels like it's Easter. Uh, oh, we're a month away. It's hard to believe it's this sunny and spring has come out, and we're still a month from Easter. So, uh, but we'll get there. Uh, hope you're making plans for Easter. I'm getting excited about it. Um, Let's go back to Luke chapter 10, 1 through 12. We're in the sixth message in this series. And it's going to kind of come together, begin to come together for us, I hope. I know we had just really people in and out for weeks now. And uh, I've just encouraged you to go to YouTube if you've missed one of these to get the piece that you're missing. Let me read, I'm going to read a good portion of the, uh, of the whole passage. But again, verse 2 is where Jesus says, The harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Therefore, pray earnestly to the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into the harvest. And then he begins to instruct us how. We've covered a lot of these, but let me let me read them again. Go your way, really, literally, as you go. Behold, I'm sending you out as lambs in the midst of wolves. We talked about those encouraging words. Carry no money bag, no knapsack, no sandals, and greet no one on the road. Whatever house you enter, first say, Peace be to this house. And if a son of peace is there, your peace will rest upon him. And if not, it will return to you. Remain in the same house, eating and drinking what they provide, for the labor deserves his wages. Do not go from house to house. Whenever you enter a town and they receive you, eat what is set before you. And that's kind of the, the first five messages that, that brought us to that point. We spent a couple of weeks on entering into houses and then eating what is put before you and what that means to us today in the context of 2019. I hope you left here last week trying to figure that out. Uh, Kim just watched it yesterday, this sermon. She missed it last week, so we talked a little bit about these and the difficulties with bringing that that passage into the context of 2019. Heal the sick in it and say to them, the kingdom of God has come near to you. So, let me put some of this together. If we are to enter into households and be working beside people, sitting at at tables where they are, being able to listen to their stories and have conversations with them so that just maybe uh, we can catch the wind of the Holy Spirit as he births new forms of witness in our time, like he did in, in Luke's time, but in our time, when, when our communities and our cities have really gotten tired of the church conversation. Okay? We talked a little bit about that last week. If that's all true, which I believe it is, and this passage is directing us to do, then it seems to me that Luke is suggesting to us a radically different location for being church. Okay? Because the Spirit of God is breaking boundaries. And so I believe Luke is suggesting a very different location for us to be church. So so a couple questions. What if one of the most important locations for being church isn't so much being centered in here, okay, but being located out there? Okay? What if Luke is suggesting that to us, as, as we interpret this, that, that 
the most important location for church is not so much being centered in here, but being located out there. And then what if an element of what God is trying to say to us in this passage is that the nature or the meaning or, or, or literally our role, our function of being church will only be discovered to the extent that, that we learn to discern what God is up to. Okay? So who we are as church, what we are, all of these things, the way we describe church it, it, it is only going to be discovered to the extent that, that we're able to discern what God is doing and what God is up to as we join him in our community and interact with the people that God is moving among. Okay? So living, living this thing out in, in our community. So what, what, whatever that is, if you can put your hand on it, whatever the nature of being the church in this community, in this city, is, what if, what if Luke is saying you're only going to be able to figure out if you get out into the community among the people that God is telling you to go to? Okay? So, so those are two big questions that come from, from where I believe we are in this passage. So... I'm saying this, and I'm, and I'm asking this question, and I ask this question of just about anybody that will sit down and talk to me about uh, church, is that when I read this passage over and over and over and over, it strikes me that the answer to the question, where are we, and that's uh, the we could be me, it could be my family, it could be this church, it could be the church in in this community, it could be the church in Dallas, it could be the church in the United States. Just asking, where are we in this passage? When I ask that question, where where do I find myself, my ministry, our ministry, the ministry in this passage? Uh, I don't believe that we find it in buildings, having meetings, but in homes, in parks, in communities, in the workplace in the places where we find the people that, that we're trying to help understand that the kingdom of God has come. And that, that last song, really, I love that because it hit in a whole bunch of different ways, but that you reign, he, you reign, this, his reign has begun. If, if we, we just sang that, right, over and over. He reigns. Do, do you believe that? I was singing a little extra loud. Emma turned and looked at me. Uh, she may not have noticed it, but she did, and I always think I'm singing too loud if Emma turns and, and looks at me. No? Okay, it wasn't because of that. Good, good, okay. Didn't mean anything about it. Okay. I usually lower it a level when, when my family turns at me, but he reigns, he reigns. I, I believe that. I believe that he reigns. Or do you believe, like some people, that he reigns in heaven and one day he will reign here? There's a, there's, there's a disconnect there. There's people who believe that. I'm not, I'm not trying to step on any toes, not trying to get into anybody's business, but there's people who believe that, that he believes he reigns in heaven and one day will reign here. That's not what my Bible says. My Bible says that in Jesus, he came and his Rain began, though much of it is spiritual now, obviously, and 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 ultimately there's there's still this physical earth, and there's things to be done, there's things to be consummated, right? But his reign has begun, and it has begun literally for the life of Christians, and he reigns, he is to reign in our lives, and so, you know, it, it, instead of of. Uh, of, of, of answering this question of who we are in buildings, having meetings, uh, I think it, for the most part, should be going on uh, sitting at tables, listening to people's stories, breaking bread with other people, in, in, enter, in, entering into conversation so that we can have a relationship with other people 
in, in, in turn, they may be able to have a relationship with Jesus. Okay, that's, that's the thing. So the location of the church is not in here, it's out there. And so I believe this is the new journey. I think it's always been the journey. But I think we've been confused for some amount of time in the way that we decided to do church. But I think if we read this anew and we can catch wind of what Luke is trying to say here, we can, we, we can think of it. But I'm telling you, it's a radical shift. It's a radical shift. And, and a lot of times I, I say things like this to people and they say, Amen. And a lot of times their eyes begin to come together and they kind of get cross-eyed and like they're looking at their nose. They're like, it's just mind-boggling that how could I begin to think that, of course the church is in here. Because it says so out there on the sign. So the church must be in here because this is where we came to have church. Well, we won't go into all those sermons and all that type of understanding, but, but this is why it's a radical shift. You know, uh, I think it became kind of a cliche for, for kind of movies when they'd make a part two or part three or part four or part, part five. Of one of those, they'd usually say, whatever, part three, this time it's personal. You know, you ever heard that cliche, that line about a movie? This time it's personal. Well, this is a radical shift because this is very personal. Okay? You know, I think that a major struggle we have with this, with these verses and what it's directing us to do, we're getting to the point now where we're in the passage is telling us to heal the sick and say to them, the kingdom of God has come near. That's very personal. That's a very personal thing. If you start talking about healing a person with their struggle, and, and you start sharing your faith with them, you know, what, what is the thing that when you're advised in, in your job a lot of times, when you deal with people, what are the two things they say? Don't ever talk about these two things. And they mean ever. Does anybody know those two things? Exactly. Are those not two very personal items? Right? Your faith, which they call religion, and, and your politics. Um. We're a very small group, but, but you could get some heated discussions going just in this small group. I just know. I know some just different views and thoughts in here. You could get some heated discussions. Imagine what happens when you get a, a church of 1,000 or 2,000 or 3,000 people. But then I'm, I'm talking more about when you leave this place, when you, get, when you go to work, when you go to school and things like that. So uh, you know what I think? It's a major struggle today because... Because we've become so impersonal. Okay? Um, what happens when one becomes impersonal? You lose the ability to encounter one another. What did I say last week? Or maybe the week before, but I think it was last week. The thing that makes you and I different than every other part of God's creation. There's one thing, if anybody remembers, that one thing that makes us completely different than anything else God ever created. We're what? We're human. That makes us very different. And part of the dynamic of who we are is we interact. We, we have this innate ability to interact with each other. Right? Right? Do you love movies? Like, these are mostly movies that are called chick flicks where you have people fall in love. Women love that stuff, right? It's beautiful when a, when a man and a woman falls in love and, and all those things, right? But it doesn't have to be falling in love. Uh, there's a whole channel that women watch. Men, you might learn something here. It's called the Hallmark Channel. 
And the only thing they show on this channel is these feel-good movies, I think. We don't have it, but I hear all the time, oh, I was watching this movie from, it's usually a woman on the Hallmark channel, and oh, it's this beautiful movie, you gotta see it. And it's usually about a romance or a friendship or just something beautiful, right? Why is that? Why don't, why don't we talk about other, other parts of God's creation? It's because they're human, and, they, and it works out just the way God intended in these movies. Doesn't always work that way in our personal relationships, right? That's why we love those movies. Stuff never happens in the movies I watch, like, you know, Jason Bourne movies or, or stuff like that. You know? <laughs> but, but what happens when we become impersonal is we lose the ability to interact like that. You don't have impersonal marriages. You don't have impersonal friendships. You don't have, you know, imp impersonal relationships, right? If you, I've never even put those two words together because they don't go together. An impersonal relationship. It's always, well, this is a personal relationship, you know, when you're describing a relationship. But I'm telling you, in our culture today, things are becoming much more impersonal. All you need to have a relationship is an electronic device, and then you can have hundreds of friends, hundreds of relationships, hundreds of all kinds of different things going on, okay? So some of you think back when we used to take pictures with cameras and go get the film developed. Y'all remember that? Kim and I was watching something just yesterday, I think, and they had a 35 millimeter camera, and there's a photographer, and then they had to develop the pictures and wait on them. Kids today, they, they don't get that. But So you sent pictures, right, to who? Did you go to uh, Eckerd's or whatever and get the pictures? <laughs> and, uh, and did you get like hundreds of copies so you could just Randomly send out copies to whoever, people you didn't know, right? Did, did any of you ever do that? Like, I need 300 copies of this because I want 300 people to see this picture of me and this puppy. <laughs> That's stupid. Nobody ever did that. I shouldn't, Kim goes, don't say stupid. <laughs> uh, it's a bad word. But people today take a picture, maybe 100 times a day, and they send it to thousands of people they never met and hope that they'll all like it and send them a message and say, I love that picture. Some of you are sitting here, I don't know what he's talking about. I don't understand what he's talking about. It's okay if you don't. It's okay if you don't. So, which is, which, you see what I'm talking about in personal. It, 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 it's become easy today to have impersonal friendships, impersonal relationships. So that's that's the struggle that we're in and trying to do something that Jesus has described here. This is extremely personal. You, you know, to, to heal someone, to help someone with their addiction or their disease and all these things, you have to know them, right? You, you do. You have to get to know them. And so this begs the question uh, when we say that what we want people to have is what? A personal relationship with Jesus Christ. That's what every good Christian says that their desire is for everyone they know. I want them to be like me and have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. This is the goal of this passage, is to go into these households, what I've described that means, so that these people can have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. What do we mean? What do we mean when we tell, when we say that our goal here at Mockingbird Community is that people have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ? That's what, that's, that's a good question. Many would say that this means I want them to have an individual, you know, personal and individual have become kind of a, the same word in the English language personal relationship, an individual relationship. 
But when I say personal, I don't mean individual. Okay, I'm not in any way. I think for most people, personal has, has, has the word's been lost, and it's more a desire, desire for an individual. When I, when I hear the word personal used, it seems that people are implying when they're talking about personal something, it's my own something. Right? So if you go into the, the health and beauty section of a grocery store and they have the personal size things or the uh, you look at the bar soap there's there's bath size and there's always the personal size what what does that mean it's individual size right well that's the that's they, we we changed the meaning of that word personal was never meant to mean individual okay it it, it and so personal doesn't mean what is private it doesn't mean individual it doesn't mean private it doesn't mean what's just for me and so why do we use that word that way? Well, I think it's kind of changed our thinking. We, we want people to have a personal relationship with Jesus. We've got to be careful. That doesn't mean they have their own relationship or individual or a private relationship with Jesus. It's, it's meant to imply, and, and, and maybe keep this and remember it, a personal is meant to imply that who we are in our relationship, okay, Get that part. Who we are in our relationships with particular people at a particular place at a particular time. That's what a personal relationship is. Who Greg is with a particular person at a particular place at a particular time. That, that makes it personal. Why is it personal? It's personal because it involves me and another person. That makes it personal. Okay? Personal has to do with the kind and the quality of person we are. Okay, hear that. It has to do with the kind and quality of person we are in terms of the character, in terms of the gifts, in, in relationship with all the people whom we are connected. So kind of begin to see that. Personal is about a connection with others. That's the word personal. That's what the, pers the word personal uh, is intended to mean. So, so to be personal, follow me on this, to be personal doesn't necessarily mean one-on-one. -on -one. It can. It can. I don't want to take that out of it. But it tends to mean that for people. It tends to mean one-on-one. One-on-one -on -one is just an aspect of what it means to have a personal relationship. So... It, it, it's, it's not to be involved one-on-one, -on -one, but it's more engaging with others in a way that is real. Human, to use my term in what separates us, is to engage with others humanly. And, and that's the part that's getting so hard. We're getting so far away from acting like human beings with each other. So it's real. And I'm not, I'm, hear me, talking about social media wasn't even part of my thoughts. It just led me here. Friendships maybe could be real in Facebook and, and all those things, but they're typically not. They're not real friendships. Okay? They're not human friendships. What happens if two people who are friends through electronics get mad at each other, how hard is it to break that friendship off? <laughs> Beep! You're not my friend anymore, and you can't see me or know anything about me. So, say you're in high school, say you're in college, say you're at work, you got a good friend that you work with, you go to school with, you live next door to with, and you've been friends for years, and then there's a beef between you. There's a disagreement between you. Can you just delete? No, nope. because it's real. It's human. It's authentic. So you get my point. That's the difference in a real human and authentic uh, relationship. Personal 
is about the, the, uh, the messiness of relationships, if you will. Real relationships are messy. You know, they, they happen over the long haul. They're for an extended period of time. And they're, they're about the hearing and the knowing and the sharing of life. That's what's critical. That, that may be the most critical part of this personal relationship thing. It's about the hearing and knowing, right, and the, and the sharing of life. Okay? If, if, if you ask me, then, Greg, do you know Jesus as your personal Savior? I think of that more as who I am, not something I do. Okay? It's more who I am. I'm a person who knows Jesus as his personal Savior. Savior, okay? I, I would say yes, 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 that is who I am. But Jesus isn't my private Savior. He's not my personal sized Savior, if you will, using the, the grocery store analogy. He's my real, supernatural, face-to-face -face Savior. That's who Jesus is. To me. And so here's what I'm doing. Here's what I'm doing with this. And, and I'll keep saying this. I'm appealing for the recovery of, 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 of a local, of a particular way of calling for the personal once more in the relationships that we have. And so anyone here that's under the age of, especially maybe under 35, is saying, Pastor, you're going way against the grain. You're going way against the way our society is heading. You say, haven't you heard that Facebook and Instagram and all of these other things, that is the way to get your name out and get to know people and to have relationships with more people. And I'm saying... That is wrong. It will tear us apart. It will ruin us as humans. It will destroy our ability to have personal relationships with each other. And if we can't have personal relationships with others, then we can't share personal relationships with Jesus. And somebody may say, well, that's all confusing to me, but God will figure that out. No, he's wanting us to figure this out. So what we need is I'm appealing for the recovery of what's local and what's particular about our calling, what's personal about our communities, where we live and we work and we thrive. For me, this is a perfect passage for 2019, and we should be talking about it every month or so, so we're remembering it. So it's right in our face. For me, it's about dwelling among, right from here. It's about working beside, right from this passage. It's about eating at the tables of men and women who we live with in the communities that God put us into, who long for, who I think absolutely hunger for a personal relationship with my Jesus. I think they do. I think they're starving for a relationship with Jesus. But all we want to talk to them about is our church. But we need to be talking to them in our personal settings of Jesus. We need to stop giving them some kind of holy sales pitch and just demonstrate Jesus to them. I have people all the time tell me, that just takes too long. It's just too slow. Well, the year after year, the less we do it, the further, the harder it will be, be, the less effective it will be because we will dilute and dilute and dilute this, this manifestation of Jesus in our, in our communities. You say, what's he talking about? The fewer, the lower the percentage of numbers in our community that are Jesus followers, the harder it gets to begin this relationship and over time help people come to know Jesus. Let me, so I'll stop with that on that. And, and there's a whole lot to talk about there, but 
I think it's time to turn to the other part of Luke 10. So this is where we've been for kind of four or five minutes. So now it's kind of time to talk to the other part of Luke. And that is the story and the conversations that the 70 were directed to share when they got into these situations. So we've been talking about the how, right? Really? How? how? Now let's talk about that message. What, what were they supposed to share at the table at work and all these opportunities that they had to, to share Jesus? What, what was supposed to be talked about at these incredible dinner table events? Well, one way uh, to answer this is, is approaching this part of the story is to ask. If the church is to be located out there, okay, if we're to be located out there in the public places that, that we live in, then what is the good news? What is the gospel we're being asked to communicate? And that's a fantastic question. People should ask that question more often. How many times in your life have you been told that I've come to share the good news with you? I've heard it a lot of times. Come to share the, or, or the gospel. You just go next door today when you, when you get out of here and you ask your neighbor, would you like the gospel or the good news? What's going to happen if they say, what is that? <laughs> oh, wait a minute. No, I'm just supposed to share the gospel. I'm just supposed to share the good news. And you're supposed to want it. And I'm making light of that, and I shouldn't. But, but that's, that, that's the question. So according to Luke, let's answer that question. According to Luke, Jesus gathers 70 disciples here, 72, depending on your translation. Same thing. Jesus gathers and sends out his disciples to tell them the future. What's fixing to happen to Jesus? We're heading towards Easter. He's fixing to be put on the cross and he's fixing to be resurrected. So he's sending people out and they're really telling the future. Our Savior's come. In him the kingdom has, has been announced and he's about... You know, that's the good news. He's going to give his life. So Luke is making the argument that Jesus' um, disciples are really about continuing his work. Okay, that, that the good news, the gospel, is someone who's delivering that is someone who's continuing the work of Jesus. Okay? About leaving places of, of being comfortable and leaving places of familiarity and, and, and control and security because isn't that what Jesus did for three years started out good we, we know it started out really good but then it became a tough road and if we're to continue that work then, then isn't that us for us uh, that what it is for us so they're sent out as Jesus said as lambs among the wolves. So that's that's the description of what, what it's like. And they're not taking anything with them. Okay? None of the comforts, the baggage of that's in their lives. And what 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 do they have? There's one thing this is package says, or a passage says they have. The one thing they do have that they get to take with, that you get to carry with you all the time. When, you, when you're sharing in all of these situations, what's the one thing that you always have that's in this passage? It's the word of peace. No matter what happens to you in your life, that's the thing that cannot be taken from you. The word of peace that Jesus speaks about here. And, and so, um, and then what's to do, to do what with that? Announce the kingdom, and what is, what is as I preached in early December, that is inseparable from announcing the kingdom, healing of the sick. 
It's, it's always together in the Gospels. Just, just read them over and over. Announce the kingdom and heal the sick. Announce the kingdom and heal the sick. Okay, we'll talk about more about that later. So, so that's where we are, friends. Uh, and 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 I had a I had a long three and a half hour lunch Thursday talking about this with a with a young pastor. And uh, this is where we are. This 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 is where we are. This figuring out. Luke chapter 10, 1 through 12 is where the church is today. And it's, it's, she's been here for some time. And so in the days, in the weeks, in the years ahead for, for us, I hope and pray that the church can recover. Not just this church, but the church as we know it. I hope she can recover um, and I hope what she decides to use to recover is one thing. God's word. Because it's all we need. It's the one thing God said to take. When you go to do these things, what Jesus said to take. The one thing is the word. Now, what version did they carry? Now, if I was in deep East Texas, I'd already had the answer to that. The King James Version that the disciples were carrying. That's a joke. Some of you are probably getting mad at me already as I speak. But the King James Version wasn't written for 1,600 years after this. Just, just, just making the point. I, I've had that argued with me. But uh, we know they didn't have any Bibles, right? They, the only real Bibles were the scrolls in the temples, right? Now they had some pieces of letters. That were probably coming together, but 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 in Jesus, in this, in Luke's time, they did. But in Jesus' time, they, they had nothing. They had one thing. They had the words of who, Jesus. And I always wonder how many times you think they had heard it. I don't, not a whole lot of times, right? Around dinner, around you know walking, Jesus had said these words. Not a single note. I have been hearing the word of God for my whole 55 years. I've read the Bible so many times, I don't know how many times I've read it. And I've read parts of it probably thousands of times. You can have this. You can take it. It won't hurt me. Not just because I have ten more of them, but, but because I don't need it. I don't need it because the word's here. And what I can't remember, there's enough of it here. And that's what they had. So, so that's where we are. That's, that, that's my hope, is that in the days and weeks ahead, we're going to figure this out. We're going to figure out how to announce the coming of the kingdom and the healing of people using nothing but God's word. Because that's all we need. But let me just close this with a word about church. Just, just, just a little word about church. Specifically, the role of the church. Okay? I believe that the role of the church is to shape the people around it in the presence of God. So get a picture of that. So God is among us, and we're supposed to shape these people that God puts us among. And we're to do that in the person of Jesus. So I'm the worst in the world about explaining the pictures I have in my mind. Just not that good at it. I wish I had an artist every week that I could work with. And, and what I just said to you would be up there. And you'd go, oh, that's great. But I just see, and I, and I tend to think of things like a body. This body that is, it could be one or it could be many people, but it's a body. And 
Jesus is present in that body. It's a beautiful thing. And God takes that body and he puts it among a bunch of individual bodies out there who have none of Jesus. And that's a local community, a local church. God has that body. He's among them and they celebrate who they are because of Jesus. And he puts them in a place and a time among all these independent bodies, if you will, all out here. And what we're to do is to bring them in and shape them. You know, any of you who are artists or know artists who take, whether it's clay or rock or anything, and they take it and it's nothing, and then they make it into something, know how you can take something and make that it's nothing and make it into something. <clears throat> and that's literally what we're to do, is to take these out here that don't know Jesus and bring them in and make them part of the body. And it's been done in two ways, I believe. There's two ways we do this as a church. And so it's not that we don't do other things, but these are the two things we have to do as churches. The first is through worship. The body of Christ that's existed around Jesus has always been worshipers. Okay, so it's always existed. Um, so it's a worship, and not to get into the description of what worship is, but let me just say this. It's a worship that directs us to the mystery, to the otherness, and the wonder that is God's grace. And I, I pray every week. I'm going to pray. You need to pray that, that that's what God does with, with our worship team. Is puts a burden on them every week that they would come in here and direct us towards the mystery that is God's grace. Can anyone here fully explain God's grace to me? Because I've been studying it my whole life and I can't fully explain it. I won't even pretend I can. Can, can you uh, explain to me the otherness of God? No. And can you explain to me the wonder of God's grace? No, we can only look at it and be in awe of it. But what our worship team is supposed to do is to help us every week do that. And that's what worship is. That's what worship is. And then the second thing is what we tend to call discipleship or spiritual formation. There's all kinds of names for it. But it's growing in Christ. It's this constant growth in who we are in Christ. These are the two ingredients that we have to have in this body that is surrounded around Jesus. <clears throat> Worship and spiritual formation. And so uh, you want to be on the mission of God? That's the two things you need. That's what you need. So, um, so Luke would say, I believe, if we could interview him today, that you could bring Luke here, I think he would say uh, that we can only understand and practice again the kingdom message of Jesus by getting out of our churches and re-entering our communities. I think he would say that. If he could come and he could see what it looked like in churches here, he would say, here's the thing you need to understand. I love what you're doing here. I love what you've done with the place, Luke might say. This is way better than we had it especially when we were on the run. This is great. Those were soft. Wow. And this heat and air conditioning, wow. Of course, say nothing of electricity. I'm just kidding. <laughs> he would say, but, but you got to get out of here. If, if 
you want to spread this message, you're going to have to get out of these comfortable seats in this wonderful air, and you're going to have to get out of here. And you're going to have to go to the people, and then, and then I won't say it all again, because we're out of time, but, but you need to do these things. And, and, and it's kind of funny, because the, you know, the, the example I used with Brian and Michael, and made Michael try to carry all those chairs, the first thing, if we said, if, you, if I were able to get you all excited, you said, we can't even wait, we're going to do it today. Some of you would start looking and going and grabbing for the things we need to take with us in order to go do it, right? Well, if we're going to do that, we've got to have this. Anyway, Luke would say that, you know, I believe this. I, I believe, you guys all know I'm working on a, so this week, I will finish all my work for my doctorate as far as residency work. Has it gone by quick? Notice I didn't say finished. That's, I just begin to write my dissertation. So I don't know how long that will take. But one of the things I've discovered in church revitalization and this study and this research is that the answers are right here. They're right here. And I've fallen more in love with Luke 10, 1 through 12, because the instructions are here. But, but I think this is where we're going to discern uh, God's future. We're not going to see it in our vision statements, in our mission statements, or our, our one person's dreams, or even a church's uh, dreams. It's going to come about when we get hold of what God is doing in this community and every other community in, in our land and, and we quit trying to create a Jesus in our image. Does that make sense? We quit trying to create a Jesus in, in our image and we, and we start portraying the image that he gave us to portray. Right now, Right here, in this place, and in many places in our land, it's time for a radical shift. David Platt wrote a book a few years ago, and he's about the tenth one I know that's done it, called Radical. And man, his church got so excited about that book, and uh, it sold thousands of copies and a lot of people read it and he went on a uh, a tour this was before he went to the IMD with Francis Chan and and, uh, and they talked about what it meant to be a radical you know what that is the bottom line I've read it, read it a couple times, it's a good book the church got really it's just flat meant to be a follower of Jesus if you're a follower of Jesus, you're radical. And if there's nothing radical about your following, then you're not a follower. Did I say that right? <laughs> if you're a follower of Jesus, you're radical in this world. If there's nothing radical about your following, then you're not a follower. Because every And that's why the book's been written ten times, name that. They just take what it says to be a follower of Jesus out of the New Testament, and, and everybody would look at it and say, that's pretty radical. Well, no, that's just being a follower. I'm going to stop because it's time to. The worship team's going to come back. But we'll continue this conversation as we head towards Easter. Let me just put this tidbit out. Uh, one thing I'm praying is that soon, most of the end of last year, I worked with some men in a conversation we called Real Life. And uh, it kind of hit some, some dry spots around the holidays, and we've struggled to get going again. But I'm going to bring... Here in two weeks, I told you I'm fixing to finish a good part of work at the end of March. It's all due April 1st, so it's got to go in one way or other, and I'll be finished with it, whatever it looks like. But I'm hoping to, hoping to kickstart this real-life ministry again. And really what that means, you say, what is that? It's really real life. What it looks like to be a follower of Jesus in real life. Well, who's it for? Real people. 
who what? Have real questions. It's just really about being authentic. So we tried some things that didn't work out, but what we've committed to is not quitting. Is not quitting. So what I want and hope to get involved in it is people that just want to get involved in it. Uh, we're not trying to do it for this, just this church or any one church. We're trying to do it for the people that live in our community. Uh, people involved in this live in Mesquite, in Dallas, and in uh, Heath. They're involved right now in this. So anyway, just to put that out there, I'll, I'll be getting some news out. We're gonna, uh, I'm going to pray, and the worship team's going to come. We're going to take our offering. We're going to sing again. And uh, Mark, thank you for being here with us today. Uh, thank you for joining us. And, and uh, uh, I just have to say, Maylene and Sully, I was so happy to see y'all this morning. I'm glad y'all are here this morning. It's good to see you. Let me pray. Father, thank you so much. And we, I do pray for those we have that are sick or traveling. The seniors we've lost in the last few weeks, not not going home to you, but just lost to not being able to go to church anymore. I pray for them. Pray that somehow each week they, they are getting fed. And, and uh, Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for your servant, Luke, who, who wrote these words down. I don't know which disciple told him this story and told him about these experiences, but thank you that, that someone did. And he recorded them. I thank you for this roadmap, this paradigm we have for reaching those in our community who have yet to come to have the personal relationship with you that I described today. And that, that's what I pray. I don't want you to myself. I don't want you just for my children and my wives and my family. I want you for everyone in this city. And Father, I pray you would use us to that end however you wish around whatever table and whatever break room and whatever shopping mall and restaurant, wherever it is, just give us opportunity to be real, authentic human beings who love Jesus. I pray this in your son's most precious name. Amen.